Hi, okay, this week we're going to continue on to our second week of research design and today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about causality and internal validity. Uh, then we'll have another PowerPoint that will talk about non-experimental design and the third PowerPoint will talk about experimental design. So the first thing that we need to talk about is causality. What does that mean? So causality means if we're doing a study and we want to find out if one thing causes another, um, if something predicts an outcome, then we need to follow some criteria so that when our results show that, we can actually truly believe that, that that's what happened. So there's three criteria for inferring causality. The first one is the cause precedes the effect in time. And that sounds like common knowledge, but it isn't always possible to know. So in my dissertation, um, there are two variables. One was placement disruption, um, where, where foster youth move from home to home. And the other one was behavioral problems. And it's really hard to tease out those two. Did behavioral problems come before foster kids move from home to home? Or did foster kids moving from home to home come first and then because of that they act out? So we can't always tell if something comes first or second, but that's important for determining causality. The second one is that two variables are empirically correlated with each other. So if you remember back to your statistics class, that means that we ran a statistic and the two variables have a relationship. We could have run a Pearson's R correlation if the two variables were continuous variables. We could have run um, a chi-square if they were categorical variables. Remember last week and the week before we discussed level of measurement? So that's another reason we need to figure out what level of measurement our variables are. So the two variables have to have a statistical relationship before we can determine causality. And the third one is they have to, um, the observed relationship cannot be explained away by another variable. So, for example, um, ice cream and warm weather have an empirical relationship, and so does um, murders in urban areas. So there's been studies done on that, right? So ice cream, warm weather, and murders all have an empirical relationship, empirical relationship with each other. Now, ice cream doesn't cause murders, right? But they have a relationship. They, they haven't been found to cause, ice cream doesn't fa been found to cause murders. What actually, the third variable that, that explains it is the warm weather. So in the summer, there's more more murders because people are outside more and interacting with each other more in cities than in the winter when it's colder and they stay in their houses. So it would be faulty to say that ice cream causes murders because that third variable, warm weather, is actually the one that helps to explain that. Okay, So that sounds like a really dramatic, obvious explanation, but um, sometimes the variables aren't quite so obvious and we have to pay a little more attention. Okay, now let's talk about internal validity. Internal validity is the confidence we have that results of a study accurately depict whether one variable is or is not a cause of the other. So, I do my study, I find out that variable A predicts variable B when I run my statistics. How much confidence do I have that that's actually What's, what's going on in my study? And, um, you know, how confident can I say that variable A depict, uh, predicted variable B? Well, one of the th things that has to happen is those three criteria we just met, they have to all be met in order for me to say, gee, I have some confidence that variable A predicts variable B. Okay, so if those three are met, then we have some confidence that we can say, my study has high internal validity. Therefore, my variable A predicted variable B. Okay. 
So there are seven threats to internal validity, seven things that get in the way that also might um, have something to do with your outcome variable. So that's a threat is anything other than the independent variable that could affect that dependent variable, that outcome variable. So what might get in the way and actually affect that outcome variable other than the variable we're looking at? So history. History can do that. Um, events coincide in time. So for example, I had a friend who did a study. She was looking at um, loyalty to presidents. And she, she was looking when um, shortly after uh, President Bush was elected. She did a survey about loyalty to presidents. Well, guess what happened the next week? 9-11. Suddenly, everybody's loyal to the president. She was going to come back and look at, at loyalty later and see over his presidency if it had changed. Well, 9-11 affected everyone's loyalty at that time, and so that was a threat to her internal validity. The other thing she was looking at, really she couldn't say they did affect it because we know that, that the effects of 9-11 were really strong and made everybody come together and be loyal. So that's how history can get in the way. Um, maturation or passage of time. So if we're doing a, a long-term study of, uh, and a, let's say we look at elementary kids and we're doing a, a pretest in kindergarten and then we're going to do some intervention that takes a couple years and then do a post-test and see if our intervention was effective. Well, kids grow up a lot during three years at that point in their lives. So the aging process could also affect their outcome variable. So we have to think about how that affects it too. Testing. So sometimes testing itself affects the, the results. Sometimes just by taking that test twice I do better on the second time. And it isn't necessarily the variable we're looking at that caused it. Instead, it's the fact that I took the test twice. So we want to look at that too. Um, instrumental changes. Now this seems to make sense to, to everyone. It, whatever you use in the pretest, you want to use in the post-test, right? Sometimes tests change though and we're not able to use the same test. Um, and so if that happens, then that's a threat to your internal validity and you need to acknowledge that. Okay, number five is statistical regression. So what this means is extreme scores are atypical of results. They're not usually replicated. You could be having a really bad day and, and score poorly on a test. That doesn't mean you're going to score poorly on the test every day. So. Um, what we call that is regression to the mean, which means that people that do really well and really poorly on a test, usually the next time come much closer to the mean, the average score. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, number six is selection bias. And we've talked a little bit about this when we talked about sampling. Um, your group, uh, your group's compared need to really be comparable. So the groups that we're using to compare each other, so let's say we're looking at one group that gets the intervention and another group that doesn't get the intervention, they need to be comparable. They need to be the same ages, they need to be similar races, they need to be similar um, genders, they need to have other characteristics that are important to this group need to be similar. If they're not similar, you might have selection bias and that would be a threat. If there's something unique about your group, we can't really say that what worked for one group will work for the other. We talked about that before. And then this number seven is the ambiguity about causal direction and that gets back to the, th the, f um, the first criteria that we talked about just a minute ago that we need to be clear which variable came before the other variable. And if we can't be clear on that, that's a threat to internal validity. Okay. Last week we talked about external validity. I just want to review that real quickly because our activity we're doing this week has to do with both external and internal validity. So the external validity means the extent to which we can generalize the findings um, to settings and populations beyond our study. Right? Can I, can I take the results of my study and apply it to another group of people? And that has to do with your representativeness of the sample. 
Remember we talked about that if you're if you used a rambling sampling, a random sampling, which is a probability sampling, you have higher external validity. And if you used a non-random sampling, you have lower external validity. Because we can't be certain that your sample represents the population in general that you're looking at. Okay, so real quick to recap. Internal validity has to do with your study design and those threats and the three criteria. If those are all met, then you have high internal validity. If they're not met, you have low internal validity. And what that means is we're not really certain in our study that variable A predicts variable B. Okay? We have low confidence if we have low internal validity. If we have high internal validity, then we can say with more confidence that variable A predicts variable B or causes. And then external validity has to do with using the results of our study and applying them to a group outside of our, our study. So external, think outside. Applying the results to an outside population. That has to do with which sampling plan you took. Random, random sampling or non-random? Okay.